Okay. Why don't you start how you got started in, in the oboe? I know it had to do with Ernest S. Williams and uh, Ithaca well, School. I, I, I studied violin and okay. played uh, fairly well. I'd, and that was in West Virginia, right? Yes. Okay. It was my home in Charleston, West Virginia. Okay. Uh, I, I did some professional playing, just a little bit. Okay. You know, weddings or uh, funerals. Things of that sort. Did you ever play in the movie theaters for the silent movies? Uh, no. Okay. Not, not for a movie. Okay. No. But uh, see, I, I was young. I, I was four, 14 when they let me in the union. Oh, wow. Okay. They, they made us an exception. <laughs> How about that? Well, I guess they were a little short of uh, violinists. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, I don't know. I got interested in. I, I thought I would like to play in a band. Okay. And of course, you can't play violin in a band. And mm -hmm. There were more bands around than there were symphony orchestras. Okay. There was a symphony orchestra in Charleston. And I was just started there when I left, mm -hmm. so I never really got a chance to play there. Uh, nor did I play in the band for that matter. Mm hmm. But uh, that was the idea. What happened was I, I was working in a furniture store. I call it furniture because that's mainly what they had, rugs. I, although I was in the rug and drape department, it was my responsibility to get the orders out, to pack everything up. And it was a good job, and I liked it. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I say, I did a little bit of playing on the side. Okay. Make a few extra dollars, and they kept my hand in it. But then... Uh, the my teacher, who was George Crum, the, the father of the composer. Oh, is that right? He was a very fine clarinet player, but of course he didn't really know anything about the oboe. Sure. But in any case, he got me started on it. Wow. And uh, he conducted the Shrine Band in Charleston. Okay. Now, you know, these Shriners have their conventions, and, and they, they get together and, and meet with each other. And, it was there that he, he met uh, Ernest Williams, okay. who had the Williams, I don't know what it was called, it might have been called the uh, Williams Band School. It was connected with, with Ithaca College of Music. Okay. He was looking for a noble player and was offered, he, he asked uh, my teacher, George Crum, whether uh, he had a pupil or news of someone who might be interested in a, in a scholarship there. Okay. He recommended me and and uh, I talked it over with my parents and decided to give it a shot. Okay. It was uh, up until that time I had no intention of being a professional musician. I mean I was happy with just playing the violin and started to play the oboe and thought I might do a little playing in the bands around Charleston. Well, in any case, I went to Ithaca, and at Christmas, one of the students had, uh, lived in Philadelphia and invited me to come to Philadelphia with him to spend the Christmas holidays. Of course, knowing that the orchestra was here in Tabito, knowing about Tabito, of course, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was the one, it was his playing on records that chiefly got me interested in the oboe. Oh, is that right? Yes. Uh -huh. So uh, I, I came here at Christmas and Williams gave me a letter of introduction, but he told me later that he, <laughs> that he knew I wouldn't be back. I had one lesson with Tabby and it was, it was a different world. Oh, yeah. Uh, you, you can't describe it. I got learned more about music in that one lesson right. than I think I had learned in the in 17 or 18 years or whatever it was before then. Wow. So I said to my friend, whose name was John Boyer, I said, uh, I, have, I have to stay here. I said, so he very kindly drove me back up, the, up to Ithaca and I picked up my belongings and came down to Philadelphia and studied with Tabby Toe for the rest of that season mm -hmm. as, a, as a private student. Oh, I see. Okay. So you dropped out of school. 
that year? I, I, I dropped out. I was only up there a month or so, a month or two. I went up in, in October, I think, and of course December, about two months. Okay. So I was there only two months. <laughs> Well, you know, yeah, it's I understand. the only thing to do. I right. Mean, you, you, you see something that is worthwhile. There I would never have been more than a, a teacher, public school teacher probably. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Or maybe you know, there are no professional bands that offer worthwhile employment. So uh, the, next, the next fall I, I, I took the audition for Curtis and, and was accepted for the fall. I went there for, well, starting my fourth year, an audition came up for the Minneapolis Symphony. Okay. And uh, Tabito told me about it. He, he, I don't know, he heard about it and asked me if, if I was interested in auditioning for it. This was for English horn in Minneapolis. Okay. I had been playing English horn in the orchestra at Curtis. So I went up to New York and <laughs> it was quite an experience. Formerly was a conductor in, in Minneapolis at that time. Okay. His boat was late arriving, so all those, the uh, audition knees were, were in the hotel, in the lobby of the hotel, waiting. Somebody came down, I don't know who, maybe his manager, and told us that he was delayed, that he wouldn't be here until the next day. So they paid for staying over in the flea house mm -hmm. in New York. And I came the next day. Well, uh, it was an interesting experience in that I was sitting in the hotel waiting, you know, with my initial. Miller came to the Mitch was trying to the job. Oh, is that right? Mitch Miller came over and introduced himself. How about that? I tell you, Mitch was a nice That's what I hear. It's still it's very interesting though. Well, uh, we played. I was the last one to play. Okay. And before before me, uh, uh, I can't remember his name, but the fellow in, in any case, Armadie was somewhat impressed with him and, and told the manager to go down and talk to him and see what kind of uh, terms he wanted. So while I was playing, she went down and, and signed him up. Ah. Uh. So, you know, then then Armadie me for the job, and uh, when she came back, she had already signed this film. Well, he uh, he wrote a letter of apology to Ted and apologized very much to me, too. Yes, that right. And then while I was there, he called uh, Barzan, who conducted the, uh, the, the training orchestra in New York. Okay. You're familiar with that or not? I've, I've heard of them. I, I just, yeah. Well, anyway, he sent me right over, and I played for Barzan, and he told me that there was a audition the next week or the week after, I don't remember, with Gabrilovich for the Detroit Symphony. Okay. So I went over and played for that audition. Mitch was there too, and it was nice to meet him again. Mitch is always, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> how about that? So I got the job and then went to Detroit. That's how I happened to become a musician. Okay. But to get back to Tabito, well, he is not only such a fantastic oboist and teacher, but he has charisma mm -hmm. to the nth degree. I mean, it, it's always fun to be with him. Okay. It's always interesting. I always enjoyed being with him. And I was with him a great deal because at that time <clears throat> when I came, you know, he, he, spends his, he spent his life making reeds. Mm -hmm. He was in that studio, the reed studio, making reeds. Uh, I, 
would say he must have averaged seven or eight hours a day. Oh, Even counting the days when he taught, I think he spent that, that much time there making room. Well, he didn't like to be alone. Right. So uh, at that time, there was a, a, a novelist by the name of Serpentini, Ernest Serpentini. Okay. Who uh, was at that time playing in the Mass Bomb Theater Orchestra. Okay. And he, uh, he was Tabito's right-hand man. He stayed there and kept him company and helped him with his rigs, you know, prepare the cane and go outside and listen to this one and listen to that one. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the next year, Ernest went to, uh, to Cleveland as second oboe in Cleveland. So the Tabito then needed, a, <laughs> oh. <laughs> needed someone to listen to him to keep him company. Right. And he chose me for some reason or other. Well, uh, I don't know. Wow. But, uh, uh, so it was simply marvelous for me because I just spent all those hours with him, listening to him and, and uh, talking, you know. It was simply a marvelous experience. So I had that all the time I was in Curtis. Wow. And uh, so as I say now, as I have said to different people, I have heard him play more than anyone alive today. Right, sure. Because I heard him as a student and as a uh, as a colleague. Mm -hmm. So that uh, I know what his playing was, and I, it was just so fantastic. There's no way to describe it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He had just had everything, mm. but of course, it really uh, started with his tone. Mm -hmm. All the uh, everything else depended on that, and that's why he spent so much time with his reeds. Okay. You know, <laughs> you read. I read today about players, professional players in some of the major orchestras, don't even make their reeds anymore. Oh wow. Well, that would have been an impossibility for him because that was without the reed he couldn't play. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And even with a good reed, sometimes he had problems because the orchestra would play sharp or certain players would play sharp and it meant that he oh. had to pitch and didn't have the flexibility okay. that okay. he would like to have had. Huh. But it started with the tone and he was able to, he developed a sound that, well, you never heard it so you can't imagine it and there's nobody or no way anyone can describe it. Mm -hmm. You can try, but uh, it was something that was just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the control that he had was unbelievable. He, he would start to make a drive and, and he would lift it up, you know, he would lift the tone and the color would change and the intensity would change. and he, he could, you felt that he was going this way and then, and then that he was moving that way. It's just as though he were walking around with the oboe. Hmm. I mean, the tone, he, he could just seem to project it one direction or the other and up and down to the left, to the right. It was, the man was simply incredible. Wow. So it wasn't just a matter of getting louder and softer and changing oh, colors. Oh, oh, oh. It was, it was... Loud and soft had nothing to do with it. Okay. It was a matter of intensity and every color in the rainbow. Uh, okay. And the way he could lift it, you can't describe it. Nobody else has ever played that way. Okay. Nobody that I have ever heard. Right. I mean, uh -huh. he could just take a note and... It just seemed to keep going up and up and up and up and never without end. Wow. Huh. And then, of course, <laughs> that was only the beginning. Okay. Then on top of that, he had this marvelous phrasing. His his conception of the of the uh, groupings, which of course he talked to all of his pupils in that famous number system, which was in its infancy at the time I was a pupil. Mm -hmm. He later enlarged on that to a great extent. Whether it was uh, of any more importance or not, I don't know whether it was important to have developed it to, to that extent. But, uh, I mean, from the first lesson, you got the idea of the number system. Okay. 
and uh, you got the idea of one, two, three, rather than one, two, three, 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 or one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, instead of that stupid counting that, that uh, is generally done, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, accent the first beat, accent the first beat. You don't accent the first beat, you're, you're building up to the last beat, mm -hmm. one, two, three, four. Well, he, he, of course, taught all this to his pupils. And, uh, I mean, right away, <laughs> I, I, I could feel that there was something there that I had never experienced before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to hear him play, it was just fantastic. Wow. So, uh, he had the groupings, he knew how to put them together, and he just had a such a feeling for the music, no matter what it was. Mm -hmm. Whether it was Mozart, whether it was Wagner, whether it was Stravinsky, Kodai, Bartok, you name it, Strauss, you know, Johann Strauss, Richard Strauss. He had just a, he seemed to have a complete understanding of what is intended in the music. Okay. To get the, to get the feel for the music. He, it was just instinctive, apparently, oh, because it always seemed to be right, the right thing. Mm -hmm. When he played something, you always felt that this is the only way it should be played. How about that? There's just no other way. Although he would play things differently at different times, but still you had the feeling that this is the right way, this is the way it should be done. There was a certain rightness no about no it. No matter yeah. what he was playing. Okay. Did, did he ever talk about his teacher and, and his training? And Yes, he, he had great respect for Gillet. Uh, Georges Gillet was his teacher. Okay. And uh, he had the greatest respect for Gillet. Okay. I never talked to him much about it. Okay. Uh, occasionally, I know he did tell me that uh, Joachim, the famous violinist, right. after he, after Joachim knew about Gillet and Tabito's story was that when he was finished with his pupils, he sent them to Gillet, or he suggested that they go to Gillet to study music. Is that to right? To get the finishing touches. Now this he told to me. Wow. Whether it's uh, apocryphal or not, I don't right. know. Right, sure. But uh, I know he, he had the greatest respect for Gillet. How about that? Um, I guess one other question uh, about Tebito comes to mind. I know Tebito won the Concours, uh, with the, the big prize at the Paris Conservatory. Did he ever talk about that experience, what that was like? or He never, he never bragged about the things that he did. He, I never heard him mention that he won the first prize at the Paris Conservatory. Is that right? I never heard him mention that he uh, you know, was decorated with the Chevalier of the Legion of Honor. Oh, how about that? And uh, I think I think that Lila mentioned some other honor that he had that he received. He never mentions it. That's interesting. He didn't have to. Well, yeah, it's true. You know, his yeah. playing spoke for itself. His teaching spoke for himself. Right. The man was just so unique mm -hmm. that uh, he didn't have to talk himself up. Right, right. Isn't that something? At that time, you know, we heard the other uh, players, for instance, uh, the other Chilet, Fernand Chilet in Boston. Right, and, okay. And uh, Lavati in New York, and uh, maybe one or two others. Of course, I heard Van Emmerich in Detroit, where I played. Listening to them, you just knew there was no comparison, no basis for comparison. Now, listening to them now, to some of the recording, I realized that they were very fine oboe players. Right, in their own right. And, mm, yeah. and, and, and Van Emmerich, even, uh, uh, and Labati were very fine oboe players. Mm -hmm. But when you listen, after knowing, after being familiar with Tabitha's play, you just knew that there was no basis for comparison. He is simply in a, in a, a, a category of his own. Okay. They're, they're not in the same 
class. Okay. He's just so unique. Mm. He was like a, you know a Paganini or or a, who was a pianist Liszt. Mm -hmm. He he made a different instrument of the oboe. The, the the sound was just so different, and yet it it was an oboe. It was still an oboe. But it was that dark, beautiful sound, and, and so smooth, mm -hmm. and so colorful, and so intense that it could, there's just no describing it. Hmm. What about uh, a little bit, uh, maybe the early days in the orchestra, working with Mr. Sikowski and... Uh... Well, I, that was an experience, too. Uh -huh. Uh, I remember <laughs> I had played a couple of years in Detroit, and then I came here and played in the at the Robin Hood Dell in the summer. And of course, right away the orchestra sounded so different. It was such a, I mean, the, the life of the, the sound was so different just in the summer with without Stokowski. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, with Stokowski, it was different again. Right. But my first first concert was. Uh, was a, a radio broadcast before the season started. I think just a Sunday night before the season started. Okay. And uh, he played the uh, Holiday at Seville, which has an English horn part. And he had the, uh, the the New World Symphony, the Largo, on the program. Whether we played it or not, I, I just don't remember. But I, I, we did the Afternoon of a Fawn. Okay. And I know sitting there <laughs> it was frightening oh yeah I bet it was simply frightening to hear uh, these players Kincaid and Tabito with that tremendous range of tone and color and I, I sat there and I said hey this is not for me I can't I, I'll never be able to do that it really was as I say, it was frightening. Yeah. It was just a new experience. Uh, I had played in the orchestra all summer. Sure. Same orchestra, all practically the same orchestra. Of course, without some of the principals. Okay. And but without Stokowski too. Okay. And it just became a different orchestra. Oh, with him. Yeah. Huh. He was. He was simply. As a conductor, what Tabito was as a as an oboist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, Tabito, of course, musically, I would have to say I would put him ahead of Stokowski, because Stokowski let a lot of things go that that Tabito would not have let go. Okay. I mean, a lot of, of mediocre playing hmm. that he was not aware of. Of course, it's not his place in a sense, to teach the players in the orchestra. I mean, okay. you can't deal, a conductor can't deal with the players in an orchestra as a teacher would with an individual student. Okay, sure, right. So, I guess he has to take what's there, take the best that's available, and make the best of it. Okay. Which, of course, he did. He had tremendous control of the orchestra. Just unbelievable contrat have let go. Okay. I mean, a lot of, of mediocre playing hmm. that he was not aware of. Of course, it's not his place, in a sense, to teach the players in the orchestra. I mean, okay. you can't deal, a conductor can't deal with the players in an orchestra as a teacher would with an individual student. Okay, sure, right. He, so, I guess he has to take what's there, take the best that's available, and make the best of it. Okay. Which, of course, he did. He had tremendous control of the orchestra. Just unbelievable control. The discipline was something you had to marvel at. Never a second wasted. Hmm. And very little talking. Mm -hmm. When he did talk, it was very often in generalities. Hmm. Not specifically, you know, about what you were dealing with in the music. Mm -hmm. He would tell you stories about 
this and that. You're playing, maybe you're playing Boris Gudunov. He'll tell you about something about the life in Russia, about how people lived in those days, or how they're living there now, or some of the experiences that he had there. Mm -hmm. uh, to give you the general atmosphere, to to set, give you the ambiance for the the music that you were playing at the time. Okay. When he when he came back to the orchestra after being gone for 20 years and did the El Amor Bruo, he gave us a long talk about the night <coughs> the nightlife in in uh, Spain. Okay. He told us about how these people went down into the caves and about the nightlife. Well, it gave you an odd, you know, it gave you some conception of the music. You knew what was there in the music from this. How he didn't have that? to tell you, you know, it's bar so-and-so, this and that. Right. No, he conducted. He didn't talk very much. Right. No, I mean, it wasn't mezzo forty here and forty there and piano and diminuendo. None of that. He did that all with his hands, with his eyes, with his mouth, with his uh, expression. Okay. Uh, no, no other conductor had that like he did. Wow. Nobody. Wow. And the orchestra was constantly alert because you never knew what he would do. Right. You, you, you rehearse it one way and, and play it another way. Is that of right? That was marvelous because right. you did, nothing ever got stale. Okay. Everything he did was was new the next day. It was something different. Now, when he would rehearse, would he rehearse uh, just sort of technically just get the notes right and the rhythms right, and you get the performance and figure out the musical interpretation, or was he always experimenting, even in rehearsal, with musical interpretations? Well, uh, no. I mean, the, the concert was in general what what he had rehearsed in general. I said, okay. Because, but uh, specifically. He, you never knew what he would do. It would okay. be different. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know what to say about his rehearsals, except as I've already told you that he talked not not too much. How about that? Not very much. Okay. Once in a while, he would uh, really lay out the orchestra. I remember once we, I think it was after he came back after his vacation, and we started rehearsing the Tchaikovsky Fifth. Okay. And we got through maybe about half of the first movement, and he stopped, <laughs> and he really laid out the orchestra. Oh, was that right? I mean, uh, I don't know whether it was a dig at Ormandy, mm -hmm. or whether he really thought that the orchestra was that this was pedestrian playing. It, it's very likely that it was. Well, this is after he came back after 20 years, he laid out the orchestra. No, 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 no. Oh, no, no oh, no, it was uh, earlier. You see, when I, when, when I started, he, 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 he conducted only part of the season. Oh. He shared the season with Normandy from 19, well, the year that I came, 1936 to 1941, five years altogether. Oh, is that right? Okay. So they shared the season. Okay. Uh, Ormandy started the season, Stokowski came for a while, I don't know what it was, six weeks or whatever. And then Ormandy came back, and then at the end, Stokowski came back again. In other words, he conducted in the late fall and early spring. Okay. Uh, so that after one of those intervals, he, uh, this Tchaikovsky fifth happened. Okay. And he really laid out the orchestra for just Know, not playing music, or just playing notes. But he was very good at that. <laughs> uh. <laughs> very calm. Right. Very calm. But boy, he could be. He could really dig. You didn't probably forget what he said either. No, and the orchestra sounded different right away. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you they did. <laughs> oh man. Huh. Well. But they were were two, certainly. Mm -hmm. And I feel very fortunate to have had that experience. Oh, yeah. It wasn't easy, but yeah. uh, it was something I'm glad I didn't miss. Oh, sure. Sure. You know, Tabito played, he could play the Bach. You know, we're talking about getting things, what the composer intended. 
he could play the Bach. He played at the Bach Festival, you know, year after year. And, okay. Uh, not only the Mass, but all of those cantatas. Every year there were different cantatas, and they all had had big oboe solos in them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know, it was just fantastic playing. And and Bach, I mean, you, you can't imagine anything any better for mm. Bach than, than the way he played it. Wow. Then he could play a, a Johann Strauss, like the, the, the Zugunder, Zugunder Baron Overture, mm -hmm. and just fantastic, completely, so completely different music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet he played it exactly as you say it should have been played. Wow. That nobody else could have made it sound like that. That's the way he was. He just seemed to instinctively know what the music is all about and know what, what to do with it. Okay. Well, see, we've talked to you here for a while. Is, is there anything else that, you, that, that you'd like to say? or? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I, okay. There's not much you can say. I mean, oh, yeah. talking about Tadjiko, there was uh, many things you could say, yeah, but the gist of it is there. There was nobody like him, and there, there hasn't been any anyone since. And I doubt if there will be anyone who right. could do with that oboe what he did with it. Yeah. And you have to remember that the oboe wasn't the same instrument that they play today either. True. Oh, yeah. I mean, there yeah. were real problems with, with the low notes. Mm -hmm. There were real problems with the high notes. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he used, you know, harmonic fingerings very often that, that he wouldn't have to do today because of Instruments are so much better tuned, so mm -hmm. much more stable. Mm -hmm. They were very, very erratic. The, for instance, the high A was a very wild note. Okay. And uh, the low notes, the low C sharp was notorious. Oh yeah, very notoriously flat. flat. Yeah. And, uh, How about that? So once in a while he would crack. You know, he would crack on a note, especially on the low note. Sure. And of course, everybody was happy that the whole Tabito cracked. Gave, gave them a little space but, to walk on. But uh, he wouldn't give in. He's right. going to play that note pianissimo if it calls for pianissimo, and he's going to crack on it rather than give in. Well, good for him. Play, of course, he could play a little louder. He never gave in on anything. <laughs> he, he would play. He would play the accompanying parts, you know, mm -hmm. or parts where he was. In, in unison with the violins. Uh, I've mentioned before uh, the time he played the Eroica at rehearsal. And he was really, he had a read that he could just do what he wanted. Mm. And in the last movement, uh, in the variation part, not, not the slow part, uh, but, but in the, where the variations are, a couple of those variations were just something that you can't imagine. And some of them, of course, are, are with the violins, and probably nobody could hear it unless he was right next to him. Mm -hmm. But he played that as, as if he were playing a, a solo all by himself. Wow. And, and that was true of, of uh, everything he did. Wow. Uh, the two parts were his playing was just as important mm -hmm. to play an accompanying part as, as uh, to be playing a solo. Okay. He did everything to perfection. Okay. How about that? And he was the leader of the orchestra. Oh yeah. No, every, everybody, everybody looked to him to, to, listen to him and tried to imitate or, or at least, everybody learned something from him. Mm -hmm. The violin players learned from him. I think you you can hear it in the in the orchestra in general. That even the, the string section somewhat adopted that style of his, that, How about that? that uh, incomparable phrasing. Well, didn't he teach string class as well as wind class? Uh, later, yes. Okay. No, not, not in the beginning. Okay. Yes, he did at, yeah. uh, at the uh, end of his career. Lila uh, mentioned that some of the string players, even though they were studying with the great string teachers at Curtis, said they learned more from Tabito than they did from, from their, their right. own teachers. Many, many, many will tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. So.
That's really very remarkable. And uh, some of the pianos, George Bullet. Okay. Same thing. How about that? And uh, Sam Barber. Okay. Composer. Yeah, he was some character. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I've heard him described as kind of a whirlwind or a tornado. It's just so much energy and uh, creative thought and, and, and intensity and and uh, well, just, he was so solid there. Yeah, he was just as solid as a rock, and he had everything. He had the tone, he had the phrasing, the articulation, the conception of the music. Mm -hmm. It was all there. Wow. I mean, as if you're talking to Mr. Delancey and Lila, you want to say hello to them because they'll see this in France. Oh, well, sure. <laughs> Hi, Lila. I haven't heard from you. It's my fault. I should have been in touch with you after that disaster out there in Seattle, although I did hear that, that uh, you were all right, that there was no problem. And... Uh, I have to congratulate you. I, I just heard, where was it, that, that you were in uh, China. It's always something new about you. <laughs> You've been everywhere and done everything, and still you haven't had enough. Now you're writing that book, and uh, I wish you success with it. And as for John, well, we shared so many battles together. <laughs> Uh, we don't need to say too much to each other. I have to give you credit for sticking in there and still, still at it, still trying to teach others, carry on the tradition. Certainly have to give you credit. And Wayne, you've done a great job. Uh, in getting some of these old boys on down on the CDs, I think the job you did on Tabito was not all that great, but <laughs> we, we've talked about that before. <laughs> I'm glad you're there, and I'm glad the three of you are together and enjoying Paris. And uh, I'll talk to maybe each of you when you get back, if I'm still around. How about Ernie Harrison? You want to say thank you to him? Oh, Ernie. Ernie's going to be there, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ernie, you were going to come up here and see me, but you never did. How come? We'll get him up here. We'll, we'll yeah, get... you, you have to get around. I have to see you sometime before I kick off. <laughs> kick the bucket, as they say. But I'll say hello to you, and you've got a great guy for a husband. Okay. And I know he thinks he thinks an awful lot of you. Well, very good. Let's let's see here.